Mighty May Show, episode 16. Let's go! Uh oh! A sync music launch! 3, 2, 1! Welcome everyone to the Mighty My Show episode 16. I'm so excited tonight because it's a very special moment and historic moment and for music and technology and blockchain in general and I'm very honored uh, to have a very special board of people with us tonight to talk about and only because this will be a special show for the two hours only about the async music launch that happened last Thursday and yeah I have no words to <laughs> to express how I feel about this drop it's such a wide range of emotions in many ways and so I'm I'm very enthusiastic in many ways about this and I try to work since Thursday's drop to learn the most I could about the um, behind the scene, what happened, and you know, retro engineer everyone's work uh, on this uh, special, really special moment. So, uh, as I participated as well, I try to avoid having too much conflict of interest talking about it, and I will try as much as I can to not make it uh, a self-congratulating moment, but at the same time, I really want, I have one word in mind is thank you and congratulation for this, and... Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Don't, don't uh, be shy to congr self-congratulate. <laughs> I mean, dude, like, everybody should kind of feel at least a little bit like that. I mean, you know, 
I go crazy, but like it's a it's a big moment, and it was a it was a huge success. So I think there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I'm happy to have you, Mai, with us tonight uh, to to be the advocate of the devil and being an ex external point of view to this talk. Uh, and, and yeah, but I'm I'm very honored. Uh, because I invited um, all the participants of this launch to uh, to be with us tonight, and and I'm so honored that everyone uh, accepted to to come talk, uh, especially the two co-founders of Async, Conlan, and No Shots, uh, Nathan, aka No Shots, and yeah, I would like to welcome them here if. Your mic is open and and introduce you. Can you can you hear us? I can kind of hear you. I don't know if you're chopping in and out for everybody else, but it seems like you might be chopping in and out. Yeah, it it seems smoother on mobile, but we we can't. I can't hear neither Conlan or no shots. Yeah, hey guys, this is uh this is digital. Um, Conlan is having technical difficulties at the moment. Uh, okay. I think a lot of people are. I'm not sure if it's the congestion on Discord or what, but um, yeah, people are having uh, some issues at the moment. Okay. Yeah, it seems very, <laughs> uh, very glitchy tonight, and we praise the Discord's gods to be with us. And but yeah. Oh, hey, glitchy for a good reason, though. You know what I mean? <laughs> Until it's solved. Uh, it's we, here, baby. That energy's here. We do are as well honored to have the presence the presence of HMLTD who participated as well as artist in, in the drop as well as Sam Brookman from the Verdi Grace Ensemble and who is also the business manager of Async and the conductor, creator and artistic director of the Verdi Grace Ensemble and Connie Digital as well. Thank you for being with us. Hey guys, thanks okay. thanks so much. It's great to be here. We have as well Brian Brickman, who did the visuals for Betty's Notebook, the piece realized by the Verdigris Ensemble and Sam Brookman. Thank you for being with us. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Cool. I'm very happy too. Yeah, and nice to meet you. And really, congratulations to all... I guess the everyone had a, a rough emotional week <laughs> and uh, it's absolutely mind-blowing what happened and what is about to happen and so I, I'm very excited. So much questions and thoughts came through my mind since the drop to try to push the discussion further and the idea of bringing us all together was to try to have a, a sort of debriefing uh, since last Thursday and how we felt and how it inspired us um, on a creative level, on, on the tech level, the business level and the historic level. Uh, so as well, I'd like to say thank the collectors who participated in the success of Async Music Lounge. And uh, yeah, it sent a really powerful message across the whole music industry, I believe. And it, personally, it felt like 10 years of prayers uh, just realized in one week. And <laughs> after five months in the making of these pieces for the Async Music Lounge, it's, yeah, I'm so grateful and uh, mind blown by <laughs> what we just lived. And, and it's just a start, like we are used to say with my world. So, yeah, thank you for, for being with us. Oh, yeah. Um, by the way, I, I unmuted you, Sam. I think you should be able to talk now. Um, Yay! Yeah. yeah. Hello. You guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. perfectly. 
Awesome. Amazing. Thanks for having me, guys. And thanks for having us. Thank you so much, yeah, for accepting the invitation. And congratulations again. Thank you. To you as well. Thank you. And yeah, this is, like Space Panther says, it's totally historical. And on so many levels, um, I... How do you want to, to let us know how do you feel first, Sam? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think let me let me sort of go from the async perspective. You know, I think on a fundamental level, um, people have been so conditioned to listen to music linearly that we've never really considered listening to music in, in a textural way and in a way that is... Um, sort of like stacking different um, variants and stacking different types of, uh, you know, similar material, but slightly different and, and really paying attention to texture and timbre and so on and so forth. And so from that point of view, um, I, I really believe that async music is, is really revolutionary in the sense that like we're not only creating music in a completely new way, but mm -hmm. we're, we're listening to it, we're interpreting it, we're getting to experience it. And we're also, as, as viewers, we have the ability to be able to be a part of it. And, and all of those things um, are, are really important. And I think like the future of what we do, in fact, there have been several musicians, um, you know, people like, uh, what's his name? Um, Glenn Gould is a world famous pianist who yeah. actually like, predicted this, This in 1969, saying that you know music, the future of music is going to be a lot more democratic, um, and we'll we'll be distributing kits to for, to people to choose whichever ones they think are, uh, you know, the most uh, or the versions that are the most um, special and and accessible to them. And so, from that point of view, I, I just think that this is this is really really amazing. Uh, from the very degree side, you know, I think this has been. You know, this work we've been working on for, uh, you know, three years now um, from start to finish. And it's it's a relief to see it out in the open. And it's also just like an honor to have it be a part of the async platform. So really, really, um, really, really exciting. And, and congratulations to everybody, HMLTD, RAC, um, you know, Brian with me, Connie, uh, Mighty. Uh, I, I think this is just It's been such a ride and um, continues to be uh, for us until Saturday. But um, what a way to kick it off. Yeah, absolutely. And I learned about uh, Glenn Gould's prophecy, prophecy uh, by watching uh, your recent podcast. And um, I, I, as a pianist, as a background uh, from piano, I knew Glenn Gould, but uh, I didn't went that far to knew that he predicted the future of the music um, like async does and i was so mind blown by that as well so uh, i think a lot of content have been put out uh, since uh, one month that uh, you know the, the project is releasing and, and a lot of uh, i felt you know try to explain how it work uh, on, on the first place and i really suggest and i will link um, everything in, in the replay, that um, everyone go watch the content that has already been produced to explain the pieces. Uh, HMLT did an awesome interview with uh, Anne-Marie Alanes, and they are going to be in a clubhouse uh, in, in uh, 45 minutes with her to continue this uh, and do a second talk after, you know, post-launch. And you did as well a great podcast with... Um, Matt and Rizal to explain the, the Verdigris piece and as well as uh, another media who is finance magnates and so yeah a lot of material has been put out to explain the pieces and I wanted to go beyond that and really invite people who are listening or, or watching to this to, to, to go check all these interviews who explain greatly all, all the different pieces and, um, and yeah as at the same time go ask you the questions that are beyond um, you know the making of yeah and I saw uh, I'd like to have a special word for for async and HMLTD as well who just released a making of uh, on the async YouTube uh, page about their process to to do the the pieces 
but one question I really was uh, curious about, uh, especially about when it comes to the Verdigris Ensemble and HMLTD, uh, like how was that to convince and explain all the musicians and you know to convince of the project about the blockchain because in the Verdigris Ensemble there's 16 people, it's a 16 people choir. And uh, so everyone has to be on the same page. I, I guess you you lead, uh, you know, you lead the way in in explaining the process and and everything. But what was their first reaction? You know, when the you or I don't know who that was for HMLTD, but the one who came with the idea to express it to the group. What was the first reaction really? And was the process too complicated or not to convince everyone? And you know. So uh, I, I'm really actually excited to hear what HMLTD says about this because um, from our perspective, uh, historically, Verdigree Ensemble has not been um, in any way affiliated with blockchain tech or NFTs or anything like that. Um, in fact, many all of our singers are freelancers in um, in the United States, uh, some of the best voices that are there. And generally speaking, you know, like when you're a freelance singer um, and when you gig from, from one thing to another, you really don't have time to pay attention to anything else because your day is full of, you know, like music gigs mm -hmm. and singing in all sorts of different ensembles. And so when I approached them and I told, you know, the 16 singers, um, we were going to do something on the blockchain. The first question was like, what is blockchain? <laughs> and yeah. then the second question was like, what's cryptocurrency? Um, and so, you know, I, I had to like really break it down and, and show them like the different um, concepts and, and how the piece was going to be programmable on the blockchain. Uh, and at, you know, yeah. up until, up until like, you know, the release there were still people that didn't quite understand what it what it was like what we were trying to accomplish and then when the singers actually got to uh listen to it and got to see all the stems and all of the different variants and so on and so forth like that's when it kind of clicked for them but mm -hmm. it was definitely like you know it was definitely uh took them off guard they're like we don't know anything about blockchain we don't know anything about crypto but you know okay like if you're going <laughs> to do a project then that's great let's do it And um, yeah, I think I think slowly but surely they're they're beginning to see sort of the possibilities, and and that's great because I think we're we're going to be doing a lot more uh, in the future. Yeah, because learning about the blockchain is a thing, but learning about the new medium, where, which is async music, which is to me really truly a new medium. Like CD was a medium, v vinyl was a medium, the streaming is a medium, and async is a medium on its own. Uh, that is truly unique and allows uh, such possibilities that are not possible elsewhere and that hasn't been ever in in histo history. Sorry. So yeah, I would love to hear as well uh, about HMLTD. Can are you with us? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm right here. Yeah. Uh, so for us, oh. I I initially reached out to Async uh, back in August last year. Um, after I found out their art platform, I was like, well, this would be amazing for music. Um, as it happened, they were actually working on it already. So we have a history in the band um, over the last four or five years of generally doing very different genres for each song, mm -hmm. utilizing sort of like playing around with the idea of um, hopping around, you know, from dubstep to sort of like jazz in the same song. And that was something we've always been doing. So the way I initially explained was like, well, what if we can do all of these things in one song, right? What if we can like, instead of necessarily spanning out Um, an album's worth of material to be able to play around with the idea of different eras or different genres or different instruments. What, what if we can contain all of these things in one single song? And initially the response was that song would sound really bad if you just mm -hmm. try and throw the, the kitchen sink at it. And then I was like, well, actually, as a matter of fact, you know, the song itself would change, right? It would be alive. Um, it's an ontologically different thing than what you would see on streaming. And that's when the question that Sam was describing, which is like, well, how the fuck do you do that? <laughs> that's when, when that was raised. And... It's a learning curve, right? Right now, I think soon everyone will be crypto native in a way. I think everyone will kind of like get that immediately. Um, but once it clicked, when that zero to one moment happened, where they were like, you can have one single thing, that's the original, that's the sort of like official version that can itself change without you touching it by itself almost or with the help of other people. Mm -hmm. That's when we started the process. And then just really, really quickly in the process, the way we did it was we kind of worked 
independently from each other, right? So we couldn't necessarily know what each other was doing and then come together, play around with the things with, with half blindness as to what the, the other people were doing to sort of ensure this idea of a truly decentralized song, right? A song that doesn't have an official version, that there isn't one true core version to it. Um, so we did a lot of back and forth with different vocalists. We have three different vocalists in the song. We have seven different people playing the instruments. We have, um, and each of them, of course, we play different instruments. Um, so, you know, we really try to embody the spirit of decentralization and the way we produce the actual song. Uh, and I think that was really important for us because we wanted to make sure that each one of the versions that are possible, so each one of the 6400 versions would not necessarily, you, would, you wouldn't be able to point at one and say, this is the one, right? This is the song. You'd have to sort of suspend judgment yeah. and say, yeah. they could all be the song at the same time. So, you know, the, the way we tried to achieve that was, was by essentially, um, you know, having a kind of like a blind process in between, between how we work and then ensuring every so often that it works with, with all the other instruments kind of thing, doing very technical work in between. I, I just, I just want to say before um, that I want to congratulate everyone for this amazing launch. Uh, the, the word revolutionary gets thrown around a lot in NFT space every other week, but I do believe that this is sort of, a groundbreaking moment in the history of music, something that hasn't been possible in like the hundreds of years. Um, and it was all coming along to here, I think, actually. You could look at it this way, right? Um, from Napster, this was kind of the um, prophecy almost, and it's kind of fulfilled now. I know this may be beneath uh -huh. that a yeah. bit, but I, maybe it's because I'm excited, um, but it does feel like something different, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no doubt. And yeah, that's why it's historical, really, because it's, uh, you know, it's new and it's uh, unprecedented and there's nothing else like it and that allows it. So, yeah, definitely it's a truly life changing uh, moment for the music industry to the music economy. Uh, and yeah, we can, it's really tangible today uh, on many ways, especially seeing new mediums uh, being built out uh, on top of the blockchain uh, capabilities and, and so on. So, yeah, I I think Discord works for Conlan now and I would love to, to congratulate and have a word to him if it works. Hey, guys. Hello. Hey, cool. Hey. Yo. How are you? Hey, good. Yeah. <laughs> nice to see everyone here. I see a lot of familiar faces in the chat. <laughs> yeah, thank you for accepting to be with us tonight. Uh, this is a very important moment for you. And I wanted to ask you how first to thank you very much for all the trust amongst the musicians and the pieces. Uh, I think the way you, you did and you managed things um, truly had great outcomes uh, creatively and really inspired the musicians on board. And so, yeah, thank you, congratulations. And then how do you feel thing since last Thursday? How do you feel? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's I mean, it's huge effort on, on just so many fronts on... You know, people on the creative side, on the technical side, the design side, uh, just, yeah, a lot of efforts on a lot of people's parts. I think I'm just feeling really good about how people are, are, are liking it. Um, I, I, I'm having a lot of fun just listening to the songs. Um, so throughout the development of this, we were listening to a lot of the tracks as they came in. And so now it's just nice to be able to go to the website and just listen to it. And, and just, uh, yeah, just, just great to see people enjoying it. Um, we're watching the records being minted, and mm -hmm. it's interesting how we had some ideas on how people would use this at first. And at first, we're like, oh, maybe people will hold their blank records and, and, and wait to see a mix. But you can see people are using them. They're recording different states. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's just really cool to see how it like – it, it's like a new mechanism. Like nothing uh, – oh, that's awesome, easy. Uh, nothing we've – like we, we don't have any any way to know how this is going to work. Like this is a new model mm -hmm. for how to make music and yeah. to collect music, and anything that we s expect people are going to do it, it's gonna it's gonna be, uh, happen in different ways. And so I'm just really eager to see how it develops as the now that the auctions are going to start closing, the layers are going to start being in new hands, mm -hmm. and then we're going to start seeing like you know do the layer owners start changing them every day? 
do they start making a big deal out of it? Like once you own like the vocals, for instance, to like leaving, maybe you make a big deal of it and you change it once a year. Like it's really mm -hmm. up to you. Yeah. Um, and so I'm really curious to see how that goes. Um, and then future, just seeing how people start making, how people start making music with this in mind, right? Like, I don't think this is going to be a replacement for all music, but this is now a new tool in musician toolboxes. If they want to do a certain type of song and they want to have human collectors be part of that song and play roles in that song, now this is a tool that they can, they can do. Yeah, absolutely. And that's uh, what I try to, to explain and to express. That's truly how I feel and how I think we all felt by composing something for it. And uh, yeah, many questions when it comes to the, the limited editions uh, mechanism, for example. And I'd love to I'd love to hear um, HMLTD about this. Uh, I I had this idea because it's the only uh, one of the four that has this uh, situation where once the 2000 uh, limited supply is minted, what? happens to the other four and uh, 44,100, uh, sorry. Um, do you think that there will be some sort of, uh, you know, they will go on the peer-to-peer, -peer, illegal peer-to-peer -peer, uh, market? Or because people will still, I think, want to reap, to record this mix, even though the limit of the NFTs, official NFTs is reached. And so people uh, will still continue to, you know, try to capture the other 4,400 versions of them. And th that's very interesting to me because it creates another layer of, um, of, yeah, of the whole living thing. Yeah, I think that's, that's really interesting, actually. Um, so, you know, for me, I was thinking about this today as I was walking around. Um, I, I, you can look at the history of, this is going to be a bit of a rant, but I'm, I'm trying to make this thing. You can look at the history of music as um, an attempt to be able to figure out how you capture music, right? Mm -hmm. So before vinyls and before wax recordings, you couldn't capture music. It was a thing that just existed in the moment, or maybe in a composition that you wrote down or something. And then slowly you have with technological advances, you have the ability to put it in an object, in a physical object. It can be the vinyl, it can be the CD. Um, and then later you essentially get the removal of that from the process, the physicality of it with, with streaming. I think that the blank records are actually more than just uh, a tool of interaction. They're a new way of capturing music that is evolving and that's fleeting. Mm -hmm. um, in that sense, uh, I think what you could see with our project, if it continues to live on, um, and if we do see eventually a point where the originals, sort of like the original blank records um, are outpaced by the changes to the song, what you could see is firstly that there would be a choice for the collectors, right? You would have maybe two records and you you'd have to wait and pick the best one, but maybe if it's like the best one comes and goes in a fleeting moment and then you never get it back again, you miss your opportunity. So there's this interesting game theoretic mechanic there in a way. But secondly, I think in what you said, again, this is imagining this, this becomes huge, um, even if it doesn't, though, the idea that you would have sort of two running histories of the song. You'd have the official history, the official narrative that's written down in the blockchain, the things that were minted, the things that appear on the on the async website of the official history of the evolution. And maybe you'd have like a shadow history, right? Of the songs that were never exactly come to be, but existed for a brief moment that could maybe be downloaded, but they would never have this stamp of them being a true vessel for the art piece. Um, do this, do, does it, that make them more, less valuable? Or does it make them more valuable? Because they were never stamped down, because they exist in sort of like potentiality, right? Or they exist like for, for a moment. So we thought a lot about time with this piece, like the idea of what well, living is about the relationship, right? It's about the different moments in the relationship and the process of always being in a state of being left or leaving or um, being left for. So, you know, maybe these are the moments that were not like remembered, right? The things that did happen in the, in the, in the world, but didn't stay in our memories. Um, we don't have a way to capture them in that way. But, you know, you could still fight them in the, in the dark web maybe. In your subconscious, right? So, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's a really interesting question, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's so much question came to my mind, and I don't know if we have will have the time to to have them all. But uh, um, to to Conlan, I wanted to ask, like, what were your technical challenges on the way, and as well as what were did you have historical referral and historic historical inspiration uh, to develop uh, the the tool. Because uh, personally, as an artist and with Connie, when we thought about the piece and 
ask, he, he asked me to, to participate. Um, there's the, you know, the first part of your brain who says, okay, let's go. And then you say, okay, but how do we do that? Uh, because it's, yeah, this new system where uh, on a musical uh, level you have to rethink how you do things and that's possible but it's just you have to be aware of the limitation the tempo the times the, the key scale and, and many details that come into play to to create such a piece and um, as well as yeah not being dissonant or having especially when you have so much combination don't have any dissonance and and such uh, but w when Connie asked me to me the first the only, I would say, the only referral point and historic point I had in mind, uh, and lately I discovered through Sam about Glenn Gould's prophecies, but my historical reference was the theme and variations uh, structure system in the classical music uh, back in the 14th or 17th centuries. Uh, I don't remember exactly, but uh, something where you have the first theme and then you have 20 variations, which are just slightly slight changes. And to me, yeah, it really clicked to, to what async music was doing. But I was curious from async perspective, if they had historical reference and technical challenge to develop it. Um, yeah, so... A historical reference, um, I mean, it, it was really just, you know, once we did the visuals, I guess that was our reference. Okay, like we can get people to start thinking about creation this way. Could it still apply to music? So I'd say just the biggest challenge was just, is it going to work or not? And rather than try and solve that ourselves, that's why we, we just reached out to some the artists, you know, early. Um, HML had already reached out on their own. And, um, and Connie was just someone we... Like I've known from early on in the space, and so that's I guess we'd rather than try and answer it ourselves. We were like, let's just let's just have the artists start trying it, and then and see if they can answer it. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'd say um, that was that's maybe the biggest challenge, and I think it will still be the biggest challenge moving forward. That to make this type of music, I mean, I'm not a musician, but I understand that it's it's pretty challenging. Like it, it's not as simple as just make you know a bunch of tracks and then put them all together like to make to make sure they sound good um there's like another level beyond that um and then the third level of course is can you make the technical part of it play into the concept itself and i think that's what all the the launch musicians have done um in some way the technical part of different ownership people owning it uh how the piece is constantly changing that's part of the music itself so that's also why I said before, like, I, I don't think this will be a replacement for all music, but like certain mm -hmm. concepts, it, it's the only way to express those concepts. So, you know, token jukebox is pretty, uh, I mean, it's very dead on, like, right, you're, you're, you're punching these, these buttons and changing the song, you know, leaving, it's a constant state of oh, yeah, all that. So um, I'd say that that's the biggest challenge for, for, and for new musicians coming into the space as well. Uh, thinking about this type of music, um, it's, Try to come into it with a concept as opposed to just trying to layer on existing music. It's almost like VR. Like when you think about VR, like everyone tried to like port over like existing VR games. And what they're finding is that traditional VR game, tr traditional games don't necessarily map to VR perfectly. You have to rethink what a game is, what an experience is, um, and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I have so, <laughs> so much questions, but uh, I'd like to ask uh, HMLTD since they have to to leave in twenty minutes. Uh, I'd like to hear them on, on a few topics. Uh, the one question, um, important question that I think every musician has to face uh, was when it came to the mastering level, uh, because to break it down on the async system, so you have all the layers, but um, the compilation of all the layers are is done digitally by a code uh, on async who combines all the stems together to create an, uh, a wave file, a final file uh, to to play the song. So as a musician, you uh, cannot really have the the mastering last layer, which is the last uh, step in musical production, who where you just 
finish the song and polish the song in the end um, uh, with all tracks combined and everything. So to me, it inspired me kind of old school mixing uh, because uh, before the, the mastering um, education developed uh, throughout the world and everything, we were kind of mis mixing uh, this way, like just putting the, the faders uh, at the right spot for everything to sound right without any additional uh, processing, post-processing. And uh, so when, as we used today to really embed the mastering step in, in the music industry, uh, I felt like it was a challenge as well. And uh, really congratulations to anyone because all the mixings are definitely impressive. They sound so great. And I think it was such a challenge for HMLTD to do so, especially having so much uh, um, layers and tracks uh, and variations possible and everything. Um, how, how did you felt this, uh, like not having the mastering frontier possible and still having this such a great sound? Yeah, so that's, um, that's something that we were worried from from the beginning, mm -hmm. which is how do we master it? Um, and then I think it took us about three weeks to four weeks to get it right. So what we did was we um, worked with our mixing engineer. Uh, we did two things. The first one was with the mixing engineer, Caesar, who's an amazing mixing engineer. Uh, what we did was we kind of cheated mastering by sort of going through different combinations. So we spent about an evening, maybe like uh, six, seven hours um, after the mixing was done where we try different combinations and we slam the limiter on top of them um, and a few sort of like different EQs and then we printed them on individual tracks um, and we kept on doing that for, for random combinations. So we did like maybe sort of like 30 to 40 different combos, randomize them, quote unquote, fake master them mm -hmm. and then print the mastering of the whole track to the individual stems. Mm -hmm. um, that's the first thing we did. And then on the other end, uh, Conlan helped us out by coding sort of like a master on the renderer. So we have, um, it's a bit kind of like um, uh, very wide because it applies to all, it doesn't vary by combinations, but we have a mastering thing at the very end where I think it's a limiter, an EQ. Um, I think there might be a tiny bit of distortion on the very, very low, kind of like get the, get the highs out. Um, and we trust, again, we did like 30, 40 proofs. Um, tweaked a bit the, the knobs there. I remember one night with Conlon, there were like probably a few hours of back and forths with different proofs and being like, can you take it like 0 0.3 dB down kind of thing? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Until we eventually got something that sounded mostly good for most things. Now, I do think that eventually you could get to a state where you, you know, you have sophisticated mastering algorithms, you know, trying to like reading what's happening, but you'll never get that like human feel. Um, so, you know, it was a challenge, but... Um, it kind of like made the mixing engineer was like, I've never done this before. And the guy's been working for like 25 years. Yeah, right? yeah. So that was pretty fun. <laughs> That's why I, I was wondering. Yeah. Because, uh, especially I'm, uh, as well, I'm producing from the composition level to the mastering. And, uh, yeah, I think it was less challenge for us with Connie and I, because, uh, we had two separate layers, which was vocals and beats. And so, uh, when plugging the two together with the code, um, and kind of tricking, like you said, having some sort of fake masters uh, um, on the two worked, and uh, but pretty pretty easily on on each version. But uh, when I thought about it for the the Verdigris ensemble, the rag piece, and what you did uh, with Living was pretty impressive to me. And I was like, okay, <laughs> when you go further, you have to be uh, facing this issue as a musician, and uh, I think that's a good thing for the upcoming musician to be aware of uh, before and maybe take uh, take it into consideration and find solutions but uh, it doesn't mean and we have the proof through these four pieces that uh, it's not a frontier um, you can trick it and have uh, absolutely great sound on all variations uh, it, it's not such a big deal but uh, it is important to to know it that it works differently and um, but yeah, about the limited editions, I wanted to say that uh, I saw some fans buying each combination. Uh, I mean, collectors, but then it becomes a fan. So when people uh, 
buys all your combination and uh, it won't be possible on living but uh, uh, on Betty's notebook or uh, on the rack piece and, and in our piece with Connie it will be possible to collect all uh, but one people doing all the versions owning all the versions is uh, such an incredible uh, message of support I believe and um, so yeah but another question was like how around you musicians that you know you know in your environment uh, that are not necessarily part of the blockchain world uh, and everything and maybe I've heard of the blockchain the async music launch since the last Thursday did you have uh, feedbacks or reactions from musicians around you and how does it look um yeah i mean uh, as we're working on it, I was, you know, sort of like talking about, because this was what I was doing for a few months, right? So I was talking about it with a few people. Um, I think it took a lot of them, uh, it took for them to see it, to completely understand it. And I think that they were mind blown by the capacity of async music. Um, you know, like technically, I haven't looked at the code, but I'm sure it's a really hard thing to be able to figure everything out in that way. The concept itself is very interesting. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of bands and musicians that... I feel would really, really fit with that model. I mean, I think it's, you know, this is kind of in between music and sonic art in a way, because it kind of like plays around the form and kind of like challenges existing notions of what music is. So it's kind of like more, it's also a bit artistic in a way, in that sense. But they've been very excited. You know, they've been genuinely very excited. A lot of people I know who are like, you know, are doing more sort of experimental music with genres, who play a lot with narratives. They've been very, very receptive. Um, I think we were lucky with the timing because we had the sort of like first NFT hype wave happen over February and March. Mm -hmm. So people understood what NFT was. And then they were able to understand also what a programmable NFT was. I think if you drop this in like January, people will be like, what exactly, what, you know, it's like, as Sam said earlier, well, first you say, what's the blockchain? Then you say, what's the cryptocurrency? And then you say, what's an NFT, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we kind of had like two of these questions covered and people just had to ask themselves like, what is a dynamic artwork? And then when that clicks, you know, you're kind of off already. Yeah. I'd like to, to ask uh, Mai if uh, you have a question for HMLTD before you have to leave. Um, Yo, yeah, yeah, I was just letting you guys pop out. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, no, I, I, there was a lot of things that I, I was thinking of as everybody was saying everything. But one of the things that like I really think that, um, you know, as a creator myself, I really like about Async is that it opens the door for... And it's kind of what you were just touching on, um, but it's like it opens the door for just new creativity. Like, and it, I think it frees this weight that I think was weighing on everybody that was a musician before we kind of discovered NFTs as a whole. Um, but this is a, a very, I think, powerful pocket where it could create a very interesting culture with very interesting music created all from the the tool itself like you guys were saying i think that's definitely the thing that excites me the most uh because it is like somebody could be making a song like they said with the tool in mind and i think when that clicks and when people realize like this is just almost a more unique creative version of music or very particular pocket what however they however they click it um it's definitely gonna I think really, really click with people in a good way. So I, I think it's, I think it's dope. And I think that obviously is reflected by the success of the first drops. Um, but yeah, that's what excites me the most. I don't know if that's a question. That's not a question though. I, my bad. <laughs> no, but that's fine. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess the question, uh, if I had to try to put that into a question and this could go for all artists, but we could start with them. Um, uh, honestly, I'm not hundred percent certain. I don't know how to say the name, but. Um, but, okay, uh, you can try. But sorry, dude, I don't even have it in front of me. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, 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 HTML TD or <laughs> HTML TD. That's it. Yeah, I, not, kind of, it kind of rolls off the tongue, actually. Though it doesn't really, though, does it? <laughs> no, I, I think it actually does, though. HTML TD. No, H you put the T too many. It's yeah. HML. Yeah. HL. HML TD. Love it. <laughs> but uh sorry uh but um but basically uh the uh, i guess a good question would be um being that i do think that this is this could create like a culture itself what's something that you could see as 
async even doing you know from from the artist perspective what's something that the async uh team could do to help facilitate a be uh, a better community and better culture so that not only are we getting the technology and the tools and the platform to to do it on with with splits um but uh but maybe something that can help the community of viewers and audience help cling to the concept itself and get more into like um the fact that there is like uh, all of these layers involved with creating the music and how you can have multiple different versions of the same song so to speak and how it's kind of all as a whole is it just a new thing uh so is there anything yeah. that, that you could see like um from your perspective that might might uh asic might like to hear i think that's a great question um so the one the the one thing that they have done, which I think is amazing, is that there's no barriers to entry in the sense that anyone can play around with this, anyone can hear it, anyone can experience it without having to buy anything, which is great. The second thing is that there is sort of like a small barrier to entry if you want to like engage with it by collecting the different pieces, uh, with a very like very low kind of like rate for for your everyday fan to be able to engage and support the artist as well. So I think that starting from that maybe would be like, I guess. Um, you know, which is something that I think Async has done from the very beginning because, you know, you, you, with, I was talking to Nate earlier and he was telling me how like Apple TV, the app that they have, is about like getting this to as many people as possible. There's no sort of like clinginess to the owning the NFT. We want to experience as many people as possible in a way. So I think what would be great is like eventually sort of like, you know, um, the, the, the house of, 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 the, of the NFT itself could be like spread as much as possible, right? Maybe you could embed... The thing that you could embed the stream on artists' websites that it would lead to the, to the auction as well to the limited edition, where you could like sort of see this thing moving and living in as many different places as possible. So whatever way that would happen, like maybe sort of specific, I don't know, um, little physical collectibles which play the song or whatever. As and I think that actually what, what what Sam's doing with Betty and and Brian, where they have the radio right, which responds in real time. That's a great idea of putting another house for this thing, right? Um, so just, I guess, spreading the different locations in which you can experience the art around from, I don't know, galleries to like houses to websites. So, so sort of like distributing that process around as well. I think that would be great. Um, but, you know, I'm just, I'm, the, the one thing I was really happy about and that was worrying me in the beginning um, when I didn't really understand exactly kind of his work was that you don't have to buy anything to be able to experience it. You know, that's what I'm really happy about. There's like tears of, in, of intimacy with the artist here in the project. And there's one tier which is like, well, go on the website, press play, check back tomorrow, press play again. So that's great. Yeah, I, I feel that. Um, I think showcasing is probably uh, or a way to kind of um, easily access the files in even like metaverse way or something unique like that. I think all of that stuff is, 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 is a cool, unique uh, thing to think about. But one thing that I thought about while you were saying that is the potential of maybe even having an async uh, type of special tool maybe where an artist can basically upload something for like a massive community to kind of determine its its final uh, resting place almost so you have like maybe like a thousand people all kind of put together this piece maybe by simple voting or something something that's more communal something that's bigger that that you could still do you know with uh, individuals or with groups and see if there's a way to kind of like incorporate mass fans. Uh, uh, that's something that that could be once again that could create a culture within the uh, within the technology, um, which is I mean it already is. There's no doubt about it. But just just thinking, of, just thought of that idea. Yeah, the I mean I I remember Connell retweeted something like a couple of months back, which was like um, I think the guys at Niftex figured out how to fractionalize. Uh, and kind of like I talk about that as well, how to fractionalize layers, put them in a smart contract and then share issue tokens against them where you can essentially vote to what the token does. Mm -hmm. So you would just be able to spread this, you know, from one person to a community of people who just vote. And then that's a whole different story, I think. So Conan, do you want to tell more about that? I don't know. Yeah, um, that's something Niftex is exploring. Um, I think they're still trying to see which piece would work for their launch. But they, they do the system where you can deposit any NFT and it generates like fractional, like fraction shards, like fungible shards of that MT. And what's cool is if you own all the shards, you can you can basically uh, claim the NFT. 
And so this allows, like, let's say there's a really uh, expensive NFT that sells for like a million dollars. You can't afford it. Well, at least you could buy like a shard of it, and like it makes it more accessible to anyone. So maybe a million people own like one 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 millionth shard of it. But then they take it to the next level where um, now they've introduced this concept where if the NFT has uh, utility, like with async, if you're a shard owner, you can like propose a contract update uh, to use it. And so you could have a community of people owning these shards of a layer, you know, voting on, you know, how to change it. So maybe like one layer is owned by a community of people who are voting on what when when off when to change it or like a DAO, you know, uh, something like that. I mean, it's a real yeah, exciting. I, yep. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I, I, and, you know, I mean, like maybe even to put more ground on it, because I know that we're just theorizing and we're just throwing out, you know, colorful ideas here. But yeah. uh, it would be uh, even to do something weekly, you know, something so that's not super complex, but something that's structured but simple that uh, could be just something that just brings people into the idea of 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 layering and creating their own song, so to speak. I think the idea of being able to just create your own song out of these layers for the artist and for the consumer is just, uh, you know, somebody said it earlier, uh, is revolutionary. I do think that the democratizing of music makes a lot of sense, especially in the world that we are in, you know, it's, it's and, and where I believe that we're going. So I think that as a whole, like, uh, yeah, I, I love it. And, um, but just finding that way to, to maybe make it so that there can be like a, a, a communal aspect as well, not just um, for the one artist, even though I'm sure that there's plenty of things uh, in the works, which I'm sure we'll get to. But I mean, what, what we're doing with one of the layers, the FX layer, we're keeping it. And we're going to be doing um, bi-weekly votes on our Discord, where our fans get to choose what the state of it will be. Cool. Um, yeah, so that was something I was really excited about. I mean, we're not able to sort of like do the whole fractionalization thing yet, but it will be sort of like keeping our wallet every two weeks, we get a vote up and people just decide what will happen with that state where the collectors make their own decisions as well. Yeah, sort of manual experimentations of what can be automated through these IDs. So, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Uh, I have to go, guys. This yeah, was thank you for so much. Thank you um, for coming with us. Uh, we yeah. let you go. And yeah, thank you. And you will have the replay to hear the rest of the conversation later. <laughs> no yeah, problem. I would love to. I'm sorry if I talked a bit too much. I just get excited about these things. But um, no, no, I'll see all of you soon. Okay. And congratulations yeah. to everyone. And congratulations to you too as well and to the whole band. Thank you very right. much. And say hi to Anne-Marie as well. <laughs> will do. Will do. Yeah. Talk soon, guys. Yeah, Bye. see you. Um, yeah, to, to resonate with what has just uh, been said uh, about the culture of um, this tool um, to Conlan I would like to ask uh, what are your plans to open um, the tool to artists I know people uh, artists can already um, apply to send pieces or IDs to, to async music uh, but do you plan to open it more widely or what's the plan uh, what's your perception to that and as well uh, I've read somewhere, I don't know, uh, and maybe you can, can confirm that. Is there a, an incentive to bring people to the async platform to stream the pieces? Or are you working on a sort of collaboration with the streaming platform so that the pieces can be distributed uh, to the regular uh, traditional streaming platforms? And um, in that ID, is there a possibility to, when you go to Spotify and listen to the piece, that it... Uh, changes uh, in following the master as well. Are those things possible? Um, yeah, exactly. Um, so on the first part, I would say that like you know our, our goal long term is always to make this as accessible to as many creators as possible. It's really about you know the size of our team and and the bandwidth we have, and you know we we just. Um, we just brought on a community manager, so we're going to start, you know, to open it up more. Um, and so our plan for that long term is with the music as well. Um, you know, we don't see ourselves as we're not trying to be an exclusive gallery in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, for the other part, um, for incentives, yes, we absolutely want it to work on streaming platforms, but um, we're, we're talking with them. And it's interesting how there is... Um, some of the technology on these streaming platforms are a bit older and they're not as versatile as you would think. 
Um, yeah. So it will be possible for async masters to be pushed to these platforms. Uh, it, it may look a little bit different than what people expect. Like it may be a playlist that has like all the mixes, like as people make a record a mix, that mix gets pushed to, 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 you know, SoundCloud or, or yeah. Spotify or something. Um, it may not be one song that's like constantly changing, even though that's what we would like. Um, just the way yeah, you know, yeah. these platforms work. Um, but then that's, uh, I think, um, HML TD mentioned this earlier, how, you know, we're going to have our own player and, um, you know, that's one area where we want to make it, you know, embeddable on other sites. So if your if your band has a website, you can embed the player directly there. Um, of course, we want to continue building out our apps so people can listen to the music, you know, with like a mobile app, um, so forth. Um, so yeah, just it's just about one step at a time, just week by week. Yeah, and speaking of collaboration, I was wondering, what are the current possibilities or what uh, your plans as well in the future about the split contracts capabilities uh, because I was wondering you know uh, when it comes to our the piece we did with Connie uh, that it could have been uh, three different uh, people doing three different vocals and three different beat makers doing three different beats and then you can throw six people uh, inside one piece uh, like that and that would be Uh, on a cultural level, very powerful for their audience and for everyone uh, involved uh, in the entourage of sure. these different artists. Uh, so, yeah, what what's the boundaries, the limitations today, and how do you plan to to push them? Um, sure. So the async music it's on the same contract as the async art, and so it works exactly the same way in that um, you know you can have different people mint different layers. Mm -hmm. So in, in you know in token jukebox, um, one layer is minted by Connie, one minted one layer is minted by you, and so um, uh, that's one way you can have collaborations. Where if you have someone come in just to do the vocals, they could mint that vocals layer, and now if someone buys that vocals layer, they'll get the they'll get the sale for that um, layer. Minters can also provide collaborator addresses to share their royalties. So if you mint a layer, you can specify another address. And so when that layer sells, you and the layer collaborators will share the royalties. Um, so it's fairly robust. Um, I don't know if we plan, I don't think we plan to do much more in that direction. Um, I think that there are other platforms that are, you know, maybe they, maybe they can try and break ground on the royalty mechanism. But mm -hmm. I think what we have for now is solid enough. Um, and we'll just continue focusing on, you know, the, the core platform and the creation tool. Yeah, that's music to my ears, and uh, I'm sure. Yeah, this type of situation will happen, as uh, as I imagined as well. New type of content, like I could think of a audio book, for example, where you change the story. You know, you record different part of the different chapters, oh, yeah. and, and then you would have audio book, uh, interactive audio book, like you can have interactive movies where the, you choose the story uh, and, and so on. That would be. I believe a, a very big market as well. This is uh, truly possible to see these kinds of um, work coming to this mechanism as well. Uh, I, I'm curious for the music, but I'm also curious for the non-music to happen with this too as well. And yeah, building storytelling or whatever, uh, sound design, storytelling, uh, it, it, so much is possible to open new perspectives uh, in this area as well. Yeah, an audiobook would be awesome, yeah. Yeah, I'm curious to invite Connie to react to everything that has been said. And maybe I'm sure he's very inspired by all of this. <laughs> yeah, what's up, everybody? Um, definitely yeah. a pleasure to be here. Uh, congratulations to I think uh, I know it's been said numerous times, but I totally agree that this is a revolution and I am happy to be a part of it. And uh, so, yeah, congratulations. Shout out to uh, Basilius. Shout out to Altsy. Uh, shout out to all the uh, blank record and limited edition owners out there. Um, but kind of like piggybacking off of uh, Conlon's uh, comments there, I, I do have a question for you, Conlon, regarding um, access and kind of like ease of use, right? So I know you guys have uh, async canvas uh, for the art. Uh, portion of things where creators can kind of self-manage and uh, 
create their own pieces and kind of push them out to the marketplace uh, whenever they see fit. And it's kind of like an autonomous, um, you know, day night cycle, as an example. Uh, are there plans to kind of do a similar thing with async canvas, but on the music front where it's kind of simple for the musicians to, to create at their own will? Or do you foresee it being more of a, uh, a process where you have to kind of like hold hands uh, for a little bit because it, it is such a new uh, sort of way to approach things? Yeah, no, a really good question. Um, I, I think for the, the 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 next couple months, it'll you know we'll probably still be doing these waves where we you know work closely with the initial musicians, but we are we have another wait list for the music part. And yeah, at some point it will be available in Canvas. When I when I say some point, I mean probably a few months. Uh, but that's the goal. The goal is to have it be completely buildable with Canvas. Um, and then yeah, at that point because I mean that's what we did with art where art's at the point now where like we have a few templates and now an artist want to create like w there's no hand holding at all we basically just click a button to approve it at the very end um and so that's where we want to get with music um yeah that's uh absolutely amazing i look forward to that um yeah one of the things too that um you know i was listening to people speak about as in like uh, the blank records and recording different mixes and things like that and the idea of scarcity, right? One of the things I think is, is quite fascinating is uh, like meta scarcity, if that's even such a thing, scarcity within scarcity, right? Where although there may be uh, 20 uh, silver uh, blank records, right? When somebody records a mix, what's written onto that mix is like the owner of the master track and the owner of each stem at that point in time in history, right? So it kind of raises the question like, uh, there are some silver uh, records out there now that has myself and Mighty as the owners of the stems. But now there are also records out there that has uh, Basilius and Odyssey as the owner of those stems because they've been sold. So it kind of creates like that that uh, provenance scarcity. Like there's only so many that the original musicians are, are, are written to, if that makes sense. Uh, so, yeah, I think it'd be interesting to see how that kind of plays out and if there's a way to toggle between provenance of who owned what at what time. Uh, I, I mean, I, I love it. Like that's that's a great point that wasn't wasn't made earlier. That all the mixes that were recorded before, like a few days ago, those are the only ones where both you and Mighty own the layers. They are in your wallet, um, and so yeah, basically yeah, that that's the meta scare. That's a great way to put it. Like at, at this point, it's pretty much impossible to get that mix again. Like you might have the same musical mix, but it's not going to show the layers weren't in, in control of, 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 of their creators anymore. So that window is kind of gone unless you guys were to like, you know, re collaborate again and, 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 and send the layers back. So that's, that's an awesome point to make. Yeah, that's quite interesting. I, maybe I would have to buy back a layer or something like that, which is also pretty interesting. Yeah. A <laughs> lot of possibilities. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I haven't thought about that as well because of the signature on the on the limited edition. That's very interesting. That yeah, the very early uh, limited editions have our name on it, and that the the new editions will be singular because of this mechanism. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's great. So thank you for for your question and point of view. I know you can were. Uh, it was kind of an exhausting process for every musician, I guess, uh, mentally and a uh, lot of back and forth as well uh, with, with the, the acing team to uh, put everything, to sort everything right and get it perfect for, for the D-Day. Uh, so, yeah, congratulations as well and thank you because uh, without you we wouldn't have uh, been there simply. Uh, we do our best to bring your best work but uh, as well your connection and uh, you know being an angel towards us uh, lead us here and uh, and I really want to thank you again about that because uh, that's priceless well I just want to say one thing on that how like uh, I don't know if we talk about this a lot but Connie was one of the first people that like kind of introduced me to the space through some of his scent blogs and actually some of the first art I collected. I think we collaborated on a Twitter bot uh, in exchange for art. And that was like the very first NFT art. Uh, I don't know. I, 
that was just interesting to so I, I think it's great to kind of bring it back and and Connie's always just on the forefront of social currency or music or that's, VR like <laughs> sorry I was just gonna say that's sick I didn't know that personally and I think that's super dope <laughs> yeah I remember uh, uh Connie I don't know if you have anything you want to say on that or yeah man no um <clears throat> You know, I'm super uh, thankful and appreciative to have these relationships with uh, so many of you guys. And yeah, we've been on this NFT Web3 grind for several years now. I know we, Colin, you and I met back in 2019 and I met with a lot of people, a lot of people in the chat right now we've met two years ago. Uh, so it's amazing how things are progressing and how fast uh, time is flying here. And uh, yeah, shout out to you, Mighty. Uh, you know, I love collaborating with you. Uh, when Colin reached out to me about this idea of programmable music, I knew I had to, to reach out to somebody who was a composer and who was an engineer that can grasp this concept, who was also familiar with Rep3 and uh, was uh, easy to work with. Uh, so you were kind of like a no brainer. Uh, so shout out to you. Uh, without you, this isn't possible either. So yeah, man, um, congratulations across the board again. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. I want to say as well that you did the whole visual uh, composition for for the layers uh, and came up with the idea of the token jukebox. So that was really a cutting edge for me that you really clicked this idea. Uh, um, from day one, uh, you, you almost told me that it was... Uh, it was going to be this, you know, <laughs> and uh, and I thought it was brilliant. I thought about the the, t the theme and variations, which uh, which is the name of our I call the, the layer, but um, but yeah. So we succeeded in embedding and try to um, think of all the aspects we could in a short amount of time to to make this possible. But uh, all, every composition uh, on this launch has done a brilliant job uh, figuring all these details out and that tells me how genius and brilliant they this drop is uh, for uh, from everyone and shout out as well from to the async team the developers the designers like you were mentioning Conlad this is very important because the the platform is so uh, mature already and I guess it's because uh, as well you don't come out of the blue. You already have the experience from uh, one year of uh, async art, uh, already running and been testing and, and you know figuring the last details of, of your tool, and <clears throat> that's why the the music side of it is already you know very very seems very mature compared to a lot of your music initiative in the blockchain uh, <clears throat> that often struggle. Uh, developing, you know, the, the the first their first really platform, uh, something that looks uh, as sweet as that, and yeah, it, very congratulations to to the teams and developers, and, and you for Conlan for for leading uh, this and Nathan as well. No shots, uh, shout out to him, and so yeah, that. Uh, and the minting aspect as well was very fluent, fluent because I saw some appre apprehension uh, about is this uh, going to be costly for artists and that's what HMLTD told uh, that uh, there is no entry barrier for artists because async is dealing most of the part of uh, the, the minting process and everything and the, the, the code is, it seems to be very well developed to the point where when we minted all these pieces uh, it was not costly at all uh, some had a lot of layers uh, and everything it was very complex but uh, it was very fluid i mean we you did all the job we just had you know this simple platform to uh, mint our layers and it was uh, i think it was really easy for us to not having to overthink too much. It was a lot of overthinking throughout the whole uh, creation. But when it came to uh, what I believe may be the most uh, apprehensive feeling for the artist was, uh, how do we, you know, will there be a barrier to, to create this and materialize uh, this on the blockchain and, and such? So, yeah, it's very cool.
the simulation is stimulating. I'm stimulated. <laughs> Thank you, Space Painter. I would love to invite uh, Brian Brickman to have a word um, with Hello. us. Uh, Hello. <laughs> I wanted to, to, yeah, first to ask you how you feel about uh, since last Thursday and uh, again renew my congratulations for your work, which is brilliant. Uh, thank you and congrats to everyone else on the panel. Um, how I'm feeling, uh, great. I'm feeling relieved. I'm excited by the reactions because, I mean, Sam and myself and the team, we've been working on this for, you know, since last year and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, been keeping it to ourselves for so long. It's exciting to finally have it out in the open because, you know, the, uh, there's a lot of questions and how do we go about doing this and will people respond to this versus that? And so it's fine. It's, it's fun to finally see it all unfold. And yeah, it's been, it's been wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. I wondering like, how do you see uh, the, the music platform, the, this new medium and this new Percep uh, sorry, perception, this new perspective, sorry, from a visual artist's point of view, and do you have feelings on that? Like, how do you see it from, from your point of view, the, the launch of async music? Yeah, so I mean, I was already very aware of like async as an art platform for yeah, the last year. That's what and I meant. It's been yeah. awesome to see, um, you know, so I had already wrapped my head around that. And so. Yeah, voilà. There's, there's a way of thinking about creating art for that, but then to add this other layer of music, and not just music, but creating art that correlates to parts of music is something that creates a new puzzle and a challenge that I found really fascinating. And it's like, how can all of these variations have a meaning and um, elevate the music? And so I thought that, you know, I think that's a step forward for music NFT art creation where right now a lot of the stuff we're seeing is just kind of like you get a piece of music and you make a visualization to it. This is kind of creating a visualization to the music in a, in a way that it's a part of the process from the beginning. And I, I think um, we're going to see it, you know, really thrive going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. And that's what I believe as well. But um, yeah, did you thought maybe about a challenge when it comes to combine the visual with the music uh, or and how you know did you manage your collaboration uh, how Sam gave you direction um, I mean on the the tech side of it um. uh, yeah I mean there was there was certainly working as as this platform is being created there was a lot of um, adjustments and kind of working within the parameters and that was something we we knew going in that this was something mm -hmm. new we we're going to have to figure it out so it was like what are the ratios what are the um you know the thing in the corner that tells you the track uh remix yeah you know working around like um extra bits of puzzles like that um and so yeah what was sorry what was the question again <laughs> no no it's okay uh, it was like on on the tech perspective. Yeah, what was the direction of Sam? Um, oh yes. To yes. So Sam came to me with this piece of music that didn't exist in the form it exists currently, but enough that I could wrap my mind around it. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I spent time researching not just Amelia Earhart's backstory, but also Betty, the subject of this yeah. piece and her story, and then deep diving into the way. Uh, Nicholas Reeves created the work, which is its own really dense deep dive in music, and it's you know it was a lot to it was a it was like a one of those like uh, crime movies where you see a wall of like papers on the wall with all these like arrows pointing to them and strings. Um, it was kind of like taking in all of this information, and then it's like how do I distill that visually in a way that kind of tells the story so that if people are experiencing the music the visuals help them kind of transcend into this this moment in time. And so with, with ours, there was this backstory about Betty listening to a radio. And so I kind of built the concept around that radio idea and then also taking mm -hmm. aspects from her notebook that she was writing in at the time and trying to take 
those visuals and kind of mix them in with, uh, you know, my own color visuals and create something that felt like the visuals added story to the audio tracks. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, I, I really appreciated to see all the visual pieces attributed to each uh, music pieces because really uh, there's um, kind of a trance going on with the additional layer of music because you, you it's a, such an experience to watch to visual art uh, but if you add um, speakers or earphones when you are in front of um, a masterpiece it's uh, another layer or another kind of experience and that's uh, what async music brings so I believe it, it does or it will influence the visual artist to uh, emphasize the experience knowing that people you know, we'd watch it with, um, yeah, with listening to something that will trans transform the only uh, visual experience. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think with ours, you know, this performance in the choir was something that was heard in an auditorium before, in mm -hmm. a big space with a group of people listening. And so we're in this new era where that's not possible. And so that's kind of where this idea of this physical radio that could have the async, that people could be in a room and experience this as a, as a group and kind of hear, hear the layers. And then also some of the layers affect the ambience that it's heard. So it makes the sound of the room it's in change. And so we kind of really got into this idea of the experience. And so that kind of all ties into that master layer physical radio. Yeah. And that worked out uh, perfectly. I loved how, you know, in this uh, in this piece there was a reference as well with the the radio, like <coughs> Connie's reference to the token jukebox. I mean, each piece has in some way references to things that already existed, existed. Sorry, and that um, yeah, maybe unconsciously or subconsciously were. Uh, historical reference or inspirations to create or help you as artists or simply humans uh, embrace the concept and help you, um, you know, lead the boat to destination. So I'm wondering, yeah, to which extent this idea of referring to an historic, historical point to create those pieces have influenced uh, those final pieces in the end and that's yeah what I was trying to to break down yeah um, well I can't the, the, the initial thing that when I heard this story in the music I related to the idea of storytelling and you know yelling into the void and hoping someone hears and sees you I think that's something a lot of artists can relate to is that we're all kind of hoping to be heard. And so this story of a woman hearing these distress calls and then mm -hmm. spending her whole life telling people about hearing this and not being heard, um, I found to be um, a storyline that was really compelling. And then the music takes the story to another level and then async takes it to another level. And now when it becomes in the hands of one or multiple collectors, they get to continue telling the story. And so I found this interesting, you know, timeline that wraps almost a hundred years now of that moment in time being told through, you know, eras. Mm -hmm. And so that's why this piece kind of ties back into this vintage feel and it's kind of elevating Betty's story. Yeah. Yeah, I really love how you, how you explain that and your point of view. I'm curious uh, from your experience um, have you ever done an async visual piece before or is it the first time you interact with async as a this visual is, well, artist yeah i had gotten accepted in august of last year and i had started concepting some pieces but i got too complicated and sometimes with these async pieces you create too much work for yourself and you become overwhelmed and that's kind mm -hmm. of where i got to and then you know, a couple months later, Sam reached out to me with this idea, and I was like, "Well, this, you know, 
this this feels like something that is exciting and allows me to continue on this async path that I uh, wanted to get onto earlier, but it, <laughs> it took yeah. me a little bit because you know once you open the possibility to like layers and variations, it's easy to overwhelm yourself. Yeah, absolutely, and that resonates with a, a, a question I want to to ask uh, Conlan, but um, uh, which is, do you think that artists and I ask you, Brian, um, do you think artists um, we will see artists that are using only async to express their career, or uh, because I feel when it comes to the music that uh, you, maybe we will see artists that only use async music or this tool to to make a career but uh, personally um, that's something I really want to explore even more uh, but that's not every piece that I do that will be you know an async uh, piece or interactive music piece so Even for visual artists, I believe, and like Conlan said, it's not to replace music or visual artists to add an additional tool. And do you think we will see artists that only use that in the future? Uh, that's a great question, and I, I don't, I don't think so because the space is so open-ended that I don't think many people that dive into the space want to limit themselves creatively like that. Mm -hmm. But I think async is a tool that every artist will probably want to experiment with at some point because it allows you to use the technology of the space in a way that no other platform does. And mm -hmm. it allows you to do something that you can only do with the blockchain and crypto. You can't do it outside of, out of the, outside of the crypto art world. And so I think, you know, that's what drew, drew me to it. I think it's, you know, such an interesting, uh, use of art. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the things that got me excited about doing this collaboration was that I got, I got to talk to people about it because I find it so exciting to talk about when I tell it to people, they lose their mind because they don't realize the possibilities. And I think people are only starting to wrap their minds around what this music side of it will bring. Yeah, absolutely. And What do you tell to people who, you know, are totally unfamiliar to it and just say, uh, what's the interest to, uh, to have a new medium? Like, I don't see the interest. I already have uh, everything I have is fine already. I don't need something new. Uh, why is it interesting? You know, something who doesn't see the interest of the existence of, of, uh, of this. Yeah, I think the... The interesting part of it that a lot of the other sites don't give you is control of the art. Um, a lot of times you're buying art and you own the art and you can share the art, and, but you can't change the way it looks. And I think mm -hmm. that's something, you know, you can't, and especially with async, you become connected with these other collectors that you're sharing this art with because you're all working together or against i guess but i think most people work together <laughs> to, to make the art look the way they want it to look or change it or have fun with it there's something about it that is really community driven in that sense and i think uh it allows the collectors to be more connected with the artist than a lot of the other platforms in the space yeah thank you i'd like to ask conlan about the same questions like uh Do you see musicians uh, using um, this tool as a unique tool for, uh, for expressing their self or interactive music? And um, the second question. Yeah, I, I think just to echo what Brian was saying, that um, it's it, I don't I don't see many artists wanting to limit themselves just to this type of art. Mm -hmm. um, It's really, I mean, we like to think of it as like a new type of paintbrush. Yeah. Um, and it's just another paintbrush that's in your, your, your palette or tool set. Um, and that being said, I think there may be some artists, you know, different artists produce work at different frequencies. And async art requires some more, you know, time and thinking to, to make into it. So there might be artists who are like, hey, I'm going to put out a piece every six months or so, and it's going to be a programmable music, a programmable uh, art. Um, and so, yeah, there might be a few people who do that. I do think with every new medium that the people who will really master it are the ones who try it a lot of times. Mm. Um, and we see that a little bit on the visual side. 
some of the artists who've come back and done multiple pieces, like you can see how their pieces grow and sophistication or um, a yeah. couple artists come to mind, you know, Xcopy, he's done multiple pieces on the platform and you can see how like his latest piece, which is the Ravel, um, like he, he took it to the next level. Like with Doom Party, he had a layer that would like, you know, cover up another, another person's layer with a finger. You could basically Doom a character. Mm-hmm. And then in Rabble, he actually did a, a layer that he just kept himself and it basically blacks out the entire piece and he uses it to communicate, you know, launches on his other platforms and such. So that was a case where he really mastered it. Um, and then another artist, uh, T.S. Moreau, he's been doing a programmable comic on async and he's done two pages so far, but you can see the, you know, the, the level of sophistication between the first and second page. Once he mastered it, um, it's really next level. It's actually, I'm actually using it as my Twitter header right now. Um, but, but, uh, yeah, so I, I think it's, it's, it's a new palette and every artist probably should try to use it at least once, um, just to see if, what, if they like it or not. Yeah, I believe it will necessitate uh, a lot of experimentation from artists uh, to reach a masterpiece uh, level of the, this medium. <clears throat> and yeah, what, what do you say as well to people that don't see the interest of having the, the new medium? And I'm curious as well for Sam's point of view on that, as he is as well uh, in async working with you. and. Uh, in the director of the Vedic Grissom who worked on that piece. So, yeah. Sam, do you want to take that one? Colin, you go first. I have a lot of thoughts on this. <laughs> okay, I'll let you go. All <laughs> okay. right. So I'll go. The short answer for me is, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think with every new thing, there's always a few people who are a little bit hesitant. Um, and there's been a few people who've said like, oh, well, you know, what's the value of, of, of flipping this layer on or off or to, you know, state A or B. And what I've always told them is that it's a creator palette and it's really up to the artist to bring meaning to that. Um, it's, and, and so it's up to an artist as, as an artist. Now you can now put a collector, a human collector in control of an aspect of your work, whether that's a visual layer, like, you know, uh, a, a smile or an expression on a face. Or if it's music, if it's, you know, your lyrics or your background track, it's up to you to see how do you add meaning to putting a human in control of that now. Um, you know, in the 20th century, if you wanted, wanted a cat in your painting, you painted a cat. In the 21st century, you say, okay, I'm going to put a cat in the painting and let now a human being can now control that cat and be the cat in the, on, in the art. So I just put it on the artist, the creator. Okay. You know, it's, it's really interesting... Um, from our perspective as let me, let me take this from two perspectives. So the, the very degree ensemble perspective is that, you know, especially in classical music and with some of the more traditional nonprofit entities in our space, and especially in the United States, um, you find a lot of people that are very used to the status quo and are very afraid of any sort of change. Mm -hmm. And, I would say classical music is is a prime example of that. Classical music really has not changed very yeah. much over the last like hundred years. You know, you still have to go um, to a concert hall. You have to dress up. You have to sit quietly. You can't pull out your phone. Yeah. You have to, like um, you know, in, in, you can't ever cheer. Um, you know, all this different stuff. And I and I think that that's truly. Um, contributing to a significantly and swiftly decreasing audience. Um, you know, we see, you know, 0.1, percent decrease every year in classical music attendance because less and less people are interested in the, maybe the music, the, the purely musical side as much as they're interested in the experience of it. And when you're, you, you know, when you're sort of like confined to a space, um, sitting there by, by yourself and you know all you can do is just like watch with your eyes like that's kind of hard um in 2021 and um even for me as a classically trained um you know conductor that's that's a pretty hard thing to do these days so what does that mean um ultimately that means that musicians um and, and yet on the other hand like musicians and 
classical um, entities in the world, and, and especially in the United States, like refuse to acknowledge that um, for the most part. And I think that some have to a certain extent, and some people are experimenting. I, I don't want to discount you know other organizations, but I definitely think that across the board, many people continue to just do the same thing. And so when when I approach singers, and when I I've I've done several clubhouses, um, classical music clubhouses, where I've talked with people about blockchain technology, and I've talked with people about new ways of bringing bringing classical music in the in the medium to to a larger, more mainstream audience, the reaction has always been, well, like we can't do that. <laughs> uh, we we have we have a tr- Tradition to uphold, and I yeah. think, like, you know, for, on one hand, like, there's something to be said about that, like upholding tradition. But on the other hand, it's, it's also like, well, how much can you uphold tradition um, without losing your entire audience? And I think that's the that's the largest, that's the biggest problem that we have. And and for for me, it, it has been particularly difficult trying to get musicians to. Um, classical musicians to, to at least acknowledge that blockchain technology could be a great use case um, to, you know, make a living, to be able to produce art, to supplement income, to, you know, um, to do a bunch of stuff. And from that perspective, like I, you know, it's going to take some time. I think especially classical musicians are, are very hard. Now, putting on my, you know, my um, uh, async biz dev, um, uh, hat, you know, it's a little bit easier when you're talking with, you know, uh, uh, you know, more of the mainstream uh, musicians, and I found that to be really fascinating, actually, because many musicians and many like artists, like uh, you know, some of the mainstream artists that we talk with, no matter the genre. They are they are more interested and more accepting of, of something that can be you know sort of done um, like some sort of experimentation with the music because I think you know it's it's especially during coronavirus like we're in a we're in a time period where we're all locked in our house you know we're all locked in an apartment or a house or whatever and we all want to find something to do and keep busy and continue doing stuff and for some that means investing in crypto for others it's doing DeFi. for others it's collecting and making nfts and then for some of these musicians it's like well how how can we push the boundaries um, you know, how can we push the boundaries? How can we make something new and different and, and build something out of this time? And, you know, we've seen that. Um, we we saw that during, you know, the, the 2008 um, recession, especially like with musicians and entrepreneurs coming out of a tragedy even stronger and creating stronger uh, companies and, and musical product. And it, I think that this is the same thing. So as as a business development person and talking with all sorts of musicians um, that are a little bit more mainstream, they're like, okay, yeah, like what's the next big thing? What else can we do? How can we, you know, challenge people? How can we create new ways and, and unique ways of, of creating this art? And, and what can we do to, to improve our medium? And so from, from that perspective, I think, you know, we're always going to get a spectrum of different people. Um, classical musicians will probably always be on that spectrum of, uh, you know, adopting things much slower than mainstream musicians. But I think there's something to be said about um, specifically with like async music. I think people see it once they understand it, they see the potential of what can happen. They see the potential of um, the ability to create multiple endings, to choose your own adventure, to, um, you know, listen to music horizontally, texturally rather than, uh, or I'm sorry, vertically rather than horizontally. Um, and so from that perspective, I think that there's, um, there's a lot of promise in the platform. Yeah, that's such a fascinating talk. And uh, I'm so honored again of your presence and uh, impressed by uh, your, your parkour. Uh, because uh, coming uh, personally from a classical music background as well, I went into specialized music school as a pianist for, for 20 years. And uh, got diplomas and stuff, but uh, I quit before the you know the the diplomas, uh, like six months before the the diplomas. I got my diplomas in piano, but uh, there was this diploma in music theory and everything, and and it was such a pressure to to get those because the the level was very high, and that's where six months before getting to those diplomas, I quit, uh, kind of bored of how 
things worked were working because of the competition between uh, interprets and and a lot of barriers that was not very fun to me anymore and that's where it led me to the dark path of uh, the mainstream music industry <laughs> and uh, and the jungle that comes with it and getting passionate about it but um I'm so glad that in this async music drop, that's something that I thought uh, since, since uh, the launch, that every major music genre um, in the world, in the music industry, is represented. Like the classical music, the electronic and ambient, the um, hip hop and the pop rock. And, and those four major genres Uh, are represented in on the first uh, async launch and I think this is just mind-blowing to me it inspires me like this talk right now is the new round table of the JD the Jay-Z's the Puff Daddy's and <laughs> you know the the big muggles of the next uh, decades uh, in, in this industry being at the forefront of the pioneering as well as on the artist side the business side and the tech side and all of that being so so creative and so powerful getting all together and being su successful this way as well with the the, the participation of the collectors that uh, without this it, it wouldn't have been such a success as well they understood the call they understood the technology they went uh, they, they wanted to to play with it with it and and i believe it's the reward that the whole concept uh, from every aspect of it, the, the tech and the creative, was successful uh, and the, the job has been done um, very fluid and, and successfully. So that's what inspires me, but I'm, I'm very um, so impressed and honored to know you as the person who is Uh, because I haven't meant one in my life, is trying to disrupt the classical uh, music genre because I know how uh, how a turtle it is, like very slow to move compared to any other mainstream genre. Uh, and people in the mainstream world that can yeah be more uh, agile To, to adapt to this and be a creative with this in a sort of a punk mindset, uh, which is not very uh, popular in the, the, the classical uh, people's mindset in general, uh, so or, or very less. So, yeah, that's, uh, I really encourage you and give you all my force and congratulations to be uh, such a determinated to take this on your shoulders and and being successful with it you you have async on your side as well for that and that's a, a great message as well from async to embed every genre and uh, and especially classical music uh, because yeah it's one of the most difficult like you said to disrupt thank you i really appreciate it and my i didn't know that you had a background in classical um i that's that's pretty amazing and and really you know Any, any person that, you know, goes through the uh, painstaking training of being a classical musician definitely has, um, can, can literally do any other genre because they have the skills and the understanding and, and you know, all that stuff. So um, also commend you and Connie. And I also just want to say, Connie, like really quickly, um, you know, I'm, I'm like such a fan, you know, in, in August when I was, you know, I've, I've been in crypto on and off for like since 2015, but my brother um, showed me Connie your one of your pieces on maker's place, which I think is called holding. And that was the first time I saw an MP3, like a music NFT um, on the blockchain, you know, on the blockchain. And that was like mind blowing to me and like totally revolutionary. And I was like, damn, like, how do I do that? <laughs> and I'm so glad that like we're in the same drop because like, I, I, you were one of the first um, that I saw, and then I was like, oh, I just like really want to do that, and I don't know how I'm going to do that. So, hey, that's such a cool story, Sam. Thank you for sharing. I had no idea uh, Jake was your brother. That's uh, yeah. Cool to me. yeah, yeah. I, he's I, awesome. I know you guys have the same last name uh, apparently, but I didn't. I didn't put two and two together. That's really cool. And no, I appreciate that, man. Holding. Um, Holding was a lot of fun to create. I've got a lot of great feedback from that. And so, yeah, I'm just happy I, I decided to, to 
see my idea through. And uh, yeah, it's brought me here to this table to be able to have a release uh, with you included, which has been very successful. Uh, so yeah, man, I'm, I'm looking forward to creating more for sure. And you know, holding was the very first NFT I ever bought on the blockchain. <laughs> What? That's <laughs> so amazing. Cool. Yeah, but I think I, I we succeeded uh, on my end uh, to ask all the questions pretty much I wanted to to ask tonight. So I think it uh, we still have like 15 minutes is the good time to uh, ask uh, my about what he's thinking uh, from an external point of view uh, from everything that has been said said in the second part and as well as um getting free like if you all together we are here if you want to ask <laughs> one to each other questions and everything i think that's the the best moment to you know just have a free talk and and everything no, i appreciate that bro um yeah this uh this was um this was a great chat um but uh yeah a lot i have a lot of thoughts i guess but um yeah Uh, I mean, I guess I could just have some questions, but, um, you know, speaking of the success of it, uh, off of just what the last thing was, I, I'm curious to see from the async team and also the artists, um, if, you know, I know that we don't like to talk about the money in this scene, but, uh, you know, I'm kind of just curious on, on your perspective, but I'm curious wh what you think in terms of what the first drops, um, basically like the value of them compared to what you maybe expected uh, and what actually happened and what you kind of see as the future. Do you think that um, it's going to stay kind of in the same range? Do you see it uh, averaging out? Uh, and how do you see that kind of being affected by the way that you guys go forward? Because obviously being that it's the first drop, you know, sometimes that can mean maybe a lot. Sometimes that can maybe mean a little. It just depends on, I think, uh, kind of what happens from there. So I'm curious what you guys, um, what you guys anticipated, and what actually happened, and then you know I'm curious what you think about the future. Uh, I can speak for Ver degree. Um, I think when I was originally thinking about this project, um, you know, I approached Brian with the twenty thousand dollar number. And um, that quickly evolved to a hundred thousand, which then evolved, which now we see like a bid for a hundred and fifty, which has increased to one hundred and eighty because of crazy ETH uh, expansion over the last couple of days. Um, I think, you know, I think we we were we were not sure exactly what to expect, and I think Brian can speak more about this. I mean, I think for me personally. Um, We were just hoping that people, um, you know, coming from classical music, you don't always find people that really understand or um, take the time to really pick apart the complexity of what classical music can be, um, and understandably so. Um, and I think I was was really surprised at how. Um, how positive the reception of Betty's notebook has been. And I think from that, uh, from that perspective, I think that the, the pricing is, was something that maybe like we were, we were surprised by, but in the back of our head, we were kind of hoping that we would get to, it was kind of a dream. And now that it's, you know, that now that we have this bid, um, It's it's just amazing to to even be able to say like we have a bid that is this much, um, so really thankful, really grateful for the opportunity, and I think that um, it's very encouraging for the future. Oh yeah, um, yeah. No, okay. I just wanted to build on what S Sam was saying. Yeah, it's uh, our thoughts early on was more of a worry of properly educating people on what they're bidding on and also creating an experience that allowed people to dive into this which this piece is 20 minutes long it's not something that you can just kind of let play in the background too much it's it's a it's a challenging piece of music but i think it's really rewarding if you take the time to to listen to it and learn about it i think there's 
there and the bigger thing is that the, this project has like 20 people involved it's a huge collaboration there's composers audio engineers 16 choir singers so it's it's a it's a much you know we went into it with low expectations but high hopes yeah um and so yeah we're i think we're all <laughs> very very <laughs> pleased that you know people have taken the time to really uh, understand the piece which uh is not it's not something you can get in like one minute you know with a normal music like pop song that you hear it and you're like oh i like that song yeah that's the that's truly a masterpiece <clears throat> Yeah, one of the things that I was going to say about that is like it, w the best part about the NFT space to, for musicians and really all creators is that it's finally a way for us to value what we do. And I think that's kind of why I, I think it's awesome to see classical music in particular um, being the thing that catches your eye and saying like, this is great that this also was valued by the community because it's like we're conditioned right now by the mainstream uh, you know, culture to believe that music has to be pop or it has to be, you know, something uh, that the majority of people enjoy. Whereas this NFT market creates a space where that that composer can have that that super fan, that somebody that or that super uh, appreciator that understands what it is. And obviously, you add scarcity scarcity to it, and you add uh, the the layerability to it as well, which is like the added element, the added elements from async. And I think all of that together is is recipe for a very interesting market in the future and uh, a, a large, a large potential to, um, to really, really be a great tool for every artist. As you said, I think like every artist will probably want to experiment in some way with this um, because it just puts value on something that they maybe couldn't have put value on otherwise like demos, for example, or other mixes and masters. I don't know if that's exactly the uh, same vibe, but... Yeah, you could have... Uh, future async pieces could have the demos as one layer, and then the final tracks as another. There's a lot of fun ways that I think people will oh, learn yeah. to use it. That's something, that's something personally I'd be really interested in uh, experimenting with. I have... I'm sure as everybody who, who, who makes their own music uh, can attest to whenever you know you get to that final stage you don't know if you like mix 7 better or if you like mix 32 better oh yeah so, uh, I see the mess coming up <laughs> yeah they're the very interesting use cases I haven't thought about that but yeah layer 1 could be the demo stage layer 2 the, the first mixes and layer 3 yeah. the, the master and everything but uh, and all the versions, but I can see the painless uh, overthinking over all that. <laughs> but actually, yeah, I love the HMLTD vision about uh, how they thought about it uh, with the band um, about the fact that uh, it's not a problem anymore to select which track is the best produced by. Um, the the drummer or the singer or you yeah, throw all them in there and, and then make the let the audience uh, choose their best version but that works with different uh, textures melodies and and stuff but that can work with the the demo to the final stage and the different versions and and such mechanism right the infinite possibilities of it was is is obviously well I, you know it's not fully infinite I guess but uh, the just the potential with it is so exciting, and um, it's good to see. And it's good to just be able to like, once again have a pocket where something like classical music or maybe more complex piece jazz music, because um, you know how many. I mean, think about think about those those uh, Miles Davis albums where there's you know like seven versions of the same track because they're basically just improvising the whole thing. You know, they'll play the head, but they'll uh, basically just be improvising every time. I think jazz could be really, really special. Um, also, but I, be, but I think you, you know, you know, I know we're glorifying slightly uh, classical music. I believe like, you know, any value you could, you could find the same value through layers of pop music as well. I think that like, you can find just as much genius in, in a, uh, in a, in a pop production than you, that you can in a classical piece. Definitely. Uh, the tools were different, but I do believe like, yeah, it's, it's, it's it's really just adding that value because of the the tool. So, um, but yeah, uh, just touching on the the market thing, I'm curious. So, do you think that do you see this scaling up 
or do you see it kind of staying on the same level uh, for now? And where's your guys' heads at when, when it comes to that? Like, do you see um, there being like more artist drops? Um, how 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 do you see the future in, in that regard? Yeah, so um, I'm sure Conlon has lots of thoughts on this, but I think you know, uh, you know, the async team really prides itself on um, doing works and and projects that have that are really high quality in terms of um, like meaning. Uh, you know, we're we're not necessarily interested in. We're more interested in like artistic intent and intensity and like. Uh, just artistry in general, as opposed to like a cash grab, you know? And so from that perspective, um, what I can say is that async art as, you know, as a platform, um, I hope that one day everybody is able to be, to access what async music can do and what async art can do. And I hope that we in some ways become almost like the next Adobe Photoshop that we're of, of, of you know, like programmable media. Mm -hmm. um, and from that, from that perspective, like, yes, of course, I think we're going to see like a large scaling of what's possible on the platform and of artists coming onto the platform and musicians and so on and so forth. Um, I, you know, I don't know. Um, I don't, I, I don't know the timeline on that, but I definitely think that the that the goal and the long term vision for this technology is to make it accessible to all, and therefore scaling, um, you know, scaling releases and and you know having you know much more than just waves once in a while, um, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I I'm th I'm thinking about um, you know for uh, a tool for artists. Uh, maybe it would be interesting to to explore having a standalone uh, software on you know on on PC or Mac for artists to just uh, have a preprocessor uh, for the final proof uh, audio proof so that uh, offline and without having to require async assistance um, a simple software where you throw in your tracks, uh, you click process and then it comes out with all the proofs so you can uh, see the outcomes um, on your end and, you know. I don't... <coughs> <But Charlie. laughs> I don't know if you understood the question. <laughs> wait, were you, wait, were you, wait, were you talking to me? Um, no, I was asking uh, Sam, maybe, or Conlan. Oh, can you repeat that question? I'm sorry. Yeah, I was thinking from the async perspective, uh, it can be uh, on the music side, uh, useful to have a standalone uh, offline software uh, that you can in, uh, set up on your PC or Mac for musicians to process the audio proofs uh, offline, you know, so musicians can uh, preview what the the look of the final pieces will look like without the assistance of async in the process. Yes, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think that there will be some sort of uh, tool to be able to preview um, the work that is being done. Um, I don't know in what form that's going to take, but definitely. Um, I mean, we already sort of have that with existing stuff. Like we, we can sort of test it on, uh, you know, the Rinkeby network or, or whatever else. You know, th there are lots of possibilities here. But yeah, for sure, there is something... There's something to be said to you know try out the product before you actually launch it, and um, we already have some of those technology uh, technologies available. But yeah, I think like a software or something like that could be a very interesting uh, uh, thing to explore, especially as we continue to expand. Yeah, a simple compiler of the tracks uh, uh, offline for uh, for musicians to to be able to preview very quickly what it looks like and like HMLTD said uh, no if you want to <clears throat> you know for the final mixes uh, it would be the the mastering tool for async basically <laughs> uh, for async music I believe yeah for sure for sure yeah but uh, thank you do, do someone uh, want to add something or final word because I want to let you on time for the listening party that you're about to have uh, for Betty's notebook. Thank you. Hell yeah.
<laughs> a big thank you. Space Painter, just very, very quickly, is asking, can a musician create a programmable version with async of a track they've already launched elsewhere? The answer is yes, absolutely, 100%. Cool. That's, that's good to know. And um, yeah, I, I wanted especially to have a word for the collectors as well, because uh, and if there's people to invest in, uh, I especially... Uh, think of all the artists in, uh, you know, that incarnates uh, the, the the creation of this new medium in the sense of, uh, like I said, you know, the new round table uh, of the people to incarnate the best, the change and the disruptions uh, occurring in the music. And especially I, I think of you, Sam, uh, about the classical uh, environment and knowing you know that the the drop uh, is successful for for verdigris ensemble and uh, I, I wanted to to uh, congratulate as well uh, nicola reeves the composer uh, he reached out to us and if there is someone to invest in it would be someone like you you know that has this determination and these uh, ideas to yeah to to and maybe you know a little bit uh, of help from the universe to be at the right time at the right place but um yeah that's uh, truly a powerful message you know to um to reward artists that uh, want to push this forward uh, and that incarnate the best the the change here so uh, I really looking forward uh, your your next moves. You know whether uh, it's uh, from the work you does in at async, but uh, uh, especially uh, on the uh, the music side and your initiative with Verdigris Ensemble. And so yeah, I would like to wish you the best with that and let know the the collectors that uh, this is the the best people to 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 bet on for. A great disruption, the right ways, uh, a disruption that is not corrupted uh, by the money grabs and people that would try to get a hand on the technology the wrong way. And so, yeah, I'm. Thank you, Mighty. Uh, that's high praise coming from you. And thank you, everybody, uh, for tuning in and for listening. Um, we do have a listening party right now. Um, which you can see on our Twitter um, if you want to come and join. Um, and I can paste a link to the Zoom um, in the chat. But I, we, uh, both Brian and I do need to go. Um, but thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very yes, much. Thank you so much for having us. Really appreciate it. And again, congratulations to everyone. And thank you to Async for all the help in getting this, this thing created, which was no easy feat. Yeah, really Thanks, wishing guys. you the best. And thank you for being thank with you us. Thank you, guys. Yeah. And see you. <laughs> see you soon. And uh, yeah, I. So that was awesome. Digital, are you here with us? Digital. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Yeah, good show, guys. That was awesome. Thanks again to oh, the yeah. whole Acing music team thought... and artist. That was a blessing to be able to ask all these questions and move forward on the thinking of this special moment. And so, yeah, what what's your inspiration right now, digital? Man, I <laughs> you already know I'm so exhausted. To be honest, <laughs> this has been quite uh, quite a process. Yeah, uh, we've been thinking about this since November, December. You know, like five months now. So, I am super excited and happy that uh, everything ran smoothly it was a success uh i really want to take a breather and a break and maybe step away i say that until i see something on twitter and then my mind just goes crazy again <laughs> uh but, but i really kind of just want to uh soak this all in um kind of relax as much as possible and uh contemplate the next move so yeah man yeah um i believe it's time to take some rest and clear the mind to see what the next big project is 
And uh, but I believe you will have <laughs> very soon uh, once we the rest will come into play. <laughs> mm hmm. Hundred percent. Yeah. So, my what's your feeling? I'm feeling great. <clears throat> it's a uh, it's ironic. Um, well, first of all, I just wanted to say uh, I tried my best to not ruin the show. Uh, <laughs> stayed in the background, but um, but uh, yeah, that was great. Um, Async seems like a like a forward thinking tool. I like the fact that they kept using the word tool because that does sound very uh, in line with the way I think about it as an artist. Uh, it seems like a good forward thinking tool for artists to create clever NFTs. And, um, you know, I think it will create uh, its own genre in a way, uh, so to speak. Not genre, but, um, you know, it'll cre it create its own little pocket of, of, of music. Um, and so that's really cool. But, uh, but yeah, um, it's funny because I literally just got off the song camp call, which obviously we'll, we'll just teasing next week. That's, that's probably what we'll talk about, uh, or at least for a little bit. We'll, get, we'll probably bring Matt on. Yeah. Um, but um, I think, uh, yeah, I just got through that process. That was fucking, that was sick too. And um, I just, uh, it was kind of uh, surreal to like, I, it's almost like, you know, you guys were all like uh, talking about congratulations and it felt like the exact same like feeling I just kind of got out of. And it's like insane to once again, like it's, it's fucking insane. I, I've said this, I say this to everybody, but it, it is insane to see what's happening right now. And the fact that we're here experiencing it, I think it's like, I don't know if it's overlooked, but I think it's hard to not overlook it because it's so powerful and so insane that, uh, we just are just so fucking lucky. <laughs> it's like, it's like hilarious yeah. how lucky we actually are to all be here experiencing you know, you guys were the first for the async drop. That's incredible. Um, we just did the first song camp drop. I think like, and these things were 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 all successful. And it just shows that not only is the technology working, it's working for the for the people doing cool shit, and people value it and people want it more. And you know, whether whether the value goes up or down, it's that people want to collect them too. And it's just the fact that people want to uh, actually have. Um, have these types of things to collect. So I think I think uh, and utilize. So I think it's just all just great. That's a great sign for, for things to come. And it's just, you know, blessed to be here with this community. Shout out digital mighty everybody in the chat. Yo, by the way, we, I mean, I just want to say this real quick because, uh, he just said, great show. Y'all, uh, Tig, Tigbo. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. Forget your actual name, my man. But like you have been chopping up, he's been chopping up clips for us. Uh, he actually took the job. <laughs> we put that in the chat. It Tig Tigbo has been chopping up clips for us for the mighty my show for the past like five weeks, but I've been just so lazy and me and mighty just haven't really figured out how to like post the clips, but there we have a lot of clips that we uh, are grateful for. So I just wanted to shout him out real quick, but yeah thank yeah. you tigbo yeah we'd love to talk and but yeah this is insane it's absolutely uh that's what i say as well uh when i explain my friends uh <laughs> and they feel the same because uh this week has been the week for me where all my friends uh bought ethereum basically <laughs> and went uh deeper than they ever been on ethereum and uh so they are like okay i bought this uh two one ethereum two ethereum and i'm like these are the same people that fight against me the next the, the five past years like hardly very hardly uh and and now uh this week they are all like okay uh and they don't even consult me. It's like uh, <laughs> they go and, and try the first experiment, uh, but with kind of a FOMO vibe, I, I feel as well. So that's funny. And I try to, you know, warn them about uh, the, the things to care, to not do too much uh, mistakes and everything. But yeah, it's been an incredible week. I'm very grateful for having uh, the icing team and the musicians here to to talk about the drop. I'd like to congratulate as well all people involved uh, in the success of the of async music launch. And I'd like to thank as well 
Token Smart for helping us hosting this and everyone in the chat for participating. Uh, I know I was uh, so focused on, on the talk that I couldn't read a word of the chat really. Uh, but uh, I mean, we will continue to debrief this uh, next week again. And uh, and yeah, bring the, the other news because like you said, uh, it's not the only thing happening uh, in music right now. It's moving fast these days and uh, that's... Uh, that's um, yeah that's insane <laughs> that's basically it's going insane so yeah i'd like to thank digital as well for being with us and uh yeah amen <laughs> hey let's let's uh let's go ahead and have maybe you know i know that all of us are psychopaths being in this space at the end of the day let's be honest guys come on <laughs> <laughs> you got to be a bit of a fucking psycho to have taken the risk to jump into this space the way that you guys have. So give yourselves maybe a 12 hour period to like celebrate or something or maybe 24 hours or who knows, maybe two years. It's up to you. <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to smack this bowl of ski right here. And uh, I, I encourage everybody else to as well. Don't do drugs. Though. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> you said what? <laughs> what? Well, thank you, everyone. I'm about to stop recording, and thank you for participating. I will play to close this the other pieces of the async drop, and uh, and yeah, that's the best way to to close this week's show. I want to play especially. I will play our piece, and then rack and all end with Betty's notebook to do uh, another listening party uh, for the token smart, especially. So shout out to everyone. Thank you, Mai. You killed it. And thank you, Kony, oh, no. for everything. No, you, you killed it, Mighty. As always, big shout out, Mighty. You you basically made this you made this uh, show crushing. I feel like they I feel like I might I may have almost ruined the vibe a few times, but that's okay. It's okay, we made it happen. That's the whole point of the show, baby. No no no, that was great. That was just perfect. <laughs> and I loved to hear to everyone perspective. Uh, on all the the questions we had and yeah this debriefing moment i would i wanted to really capture the hot takes uh you know very close to to the launch so that we have this souvenir to point back in time and see how all these crazy ideas we talked about tonight uh has realized in the future and in what sense and what dimensions and everything so that will be a good reference to to come back at i feel <laughs> oh yeah well until next until next time chat you know i would yeah. love to keep the conversation going somewhere i don't know exactly where to direct everybody to but it would be awesome if we could start to get some people to just like interact with us about the show throughout the week you know mm -hmm. so we can kind of keep the combo going you know what i'm saying and then we can hear from you guys you know maybe there's something that you guys are interested in that you want us to talk about the, the upcoming week something that you're excited about all that stuff i'm into it um, we'll figure it out though. Yeah. Absolutely. And cool. so yeah. I wish everyone a good week and we are about to get rest. <laughs> bye bye yes. digital. Yes. See you in the next frontier. <laughs> and uh yeah. Shout out to everyone. That was a great show. And I'm gonna play the token jukebox from Async Music Drop. And let's go. And let's go. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>all these people led astray praying for a better day i hope they find their way out and we can go and celebrate catch the vibe ride the wave shorty don't be afraid yeah catch the vibe ride the wave shorty don't be afraid yeah catch the vibe ride the wave shorty don't be afraid yeah catch the vibe ride the wave shorty don't be afraid yeah catch the vibe ride the wave shorty don't be afraid yeah catch the vibe ride the wave shorty don't be afraid yeah catch the vibe ride the wave shorty don't be afraid Catch the vibe, ride the wave, shorty don't be afraid Raise your consciousness, 
So you can face the consequence Yeah, I know it's common sense But not taught in these colleges Raise your consciousness Or you can face the consequence Yeah, I know it's common sense But not taught in these colleges Ain't nobody gonna save us We gotta save ourselves While you're waiting on a savior I decide to save myself Ain't nobody gonna save us We gotta save ourselves While you're waiting on a savior I decide to save myself Catch the vibe, ride the wave Shorty, don't be afraid, yeah Catch the vibe, ride the wave Shorty, don't be afraid, yeah Catch the vibe, ride the wave Shorty, don't be afraid, yeah Catch the vibe, ride the wave Shorty, don't be afraid, yeah Yeah, digital baby Mighty 33 Async, async all these people led astray Praying for a better day I hope they find their way out And we can go and celebrate All these people led astray Praying for a better day I hope they find their way out And we can go and celebrate